that produces. Listen, don't think callously. Well, I prayed the prayer. I'm all set. This is a warning. Listen up. Do you really have this? Or are you just thinking that it's yours and perilously heading toward the falls? If you're just kind of backslid spiritually, listen, Jesus will be the rock in the middle of the river for those who are truly His. But He will draw you back to Himself. And that condition won't last for very long. If you don't know Him truly, though, you're going right over the fall. Walk, walk in the Word, walk in the Word, walk, walk in the Word. This is the way. All right, get your Bibles and open your Bible to Hebrews uh, chapter 2. And it's good that we can have a little bit of uh, humor at the beginning because it's a very serious, serious message this morning. And I woke up thinking about it and... uh, The passage in front of us this morning is a warning, and uh, there are five warnings in um, the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 is the first warning passage. In fact, if you've uh, figured out what a great thing it is to write in the margin of your Bible, as everyone who attends here has, um, just write in your Bible, or better, write in your neighbor's Bible, just write warning right there. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4, listen as I read it. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Now for the sake of review, uh, let's remember the theme for the year is don't stop now. And uh, that the Christian life is not a destination, it's a journey. And while it begins at a point in time, it most certainly does not stop there. Is that right? It doesn't stop there. We are supposed to be hanging around the cross. We're supposed to be moving on into all the great things that God has for us. And so chapter 1 was not about the journey. Isn't this cool? It's like a suitcase. And by the end of the year, we're going to have little stickers all over it. We're on a journey. Isn't that cool? And so chapter 1 was look up. And the point of that is, is that before we can go on this journey, we need to focus on the object of our faith, who is Jesus Christ the Lord. And in chapter 1 and 2 messages, Christ was revealed in all of His glory and and why we love Him and why we long for Him and why we're seeking Him and giving our lives to Him. And so now that we have our eyes firmly fixed on the prize, who is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, now chapter uh, 2 through 4 begins the first subplot. And the first subplot is keep up. You came to the cross, you made a commitment of your life to Christ, but look at a lot of people are moving on and going on from glory to glory with the Lord. What about you? Don't fall behind. In fact, that's one of the primary messages of the whole book of Hebrews is, is don't fall behind, don't drift away, uh, don't let your heart become hard and cold and callous to the things of Christ. So the title of the message this morning is keep up, don't drift away, as in don't drift away. As in, don't drift away. As in, don't drift away. Got it? Why don't you tell your neighbor, don't drift away. Just tell him. Don't drift away. Keep up. Keep up. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord's help with this message. And uh, you pray with me. And we're going to jump into these four verses. Lord, thank you this morning for the privilege of being here. Thank you for the not just the responsibility before us, but for the opportunity to have our lives shaped and changed by what we hear and apply. And so I pray this morning, Lord, that according to your will and by your Spirit, through your Word, that you would quicken fresh love and passion and fervency in us, that we would not drift away from all that is ours in Christ. So help us and renew us and revive our hearts in passionate commitment to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's the first thought. Don't drift away from your salvation. Don't drift away from your salvation. I think you can see that clearly in the text. And uh, when I use the word salvation, let's just be reminded what we're talking about. Biblically, the term salvation describes uh, a four-part thing. Election, 
uh, elect in him, chosen before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. Justification, or some call it conversion, where we come to the cross, we repent of our sins, and we embrace Christ by faith. Some people call that salvation, but technically, theologically, biblically, that's conversion or justification. So election, when God chooses us, justification or conversion, when we respond to what God has done by faith and come into a personal relationship with him, sanctification, uh, the, the rest of my life uh, by which God takes what he's done and makes it a reality in me and conforms me more and more to the image of Christ, and then glorification, 1 John 3, when he appears we'll, see him, we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. Now all four of those things, election, justification, sanctification, glorification, is salvation. That's what salvation is. It's all of that. Sometimes in the Bible, uh, when it uses the word salvation, it's talking about conversion only. Sometimes it's talking about sanctification or one of the parts. But the drawer, there's four files in the drawer. Election, justification, sanctification, glorification. But the drawer is salvation. It's all of that. And so when he says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He has all of those things in mind, but here I think most specifically in mind, he has your conversion. He has what happened to you when you went to the cross by faith. He's like, some things happened, and don't uh, neglect that. Don't neglect that at all. When you came to Christ, you made some promises to God, didn't you? Am I right? And, and God made some promises to you too, am I right? Now God's going to keep his promises. You don't, this passage is not for God. Who's it for? It's for us. God's going to keep his promises. Make sure you keep your promises to God. That's what this is all about. Now here's the thing. What he's going to really say in the passages is the people who don't keep the promises that they've made to God don't really know the Lord. Never really did know the Lord. And here's the problem with salvation. I want you to imagine for a moment that I have uh, something uh, under my coat here, something very secretive, something, it's a great treasure, it's very precious to me. And, but you can't see what's under my coat, so you don't know whether I really have a treasure in here or not. Is that right? And, and you say, yeah, well, we don't know whether you have something in there, but we'll be able to tell over time if you have great treasure because it'll weigh you down as you walk and you won't be worried about your future anymore if you have great treasure and, and you'll have a lot of joyfulness all the time because you have great treasure. See, you can't see whether I have it or not, but over time you'll be able to tell whether I have it. And the same is true of salvation. Just because a person prays a prayer or says some things we don't know whether they've really been born again of the Spirit of God in their heart. We can't tell for sure. Is it in there? We can't see. We don't know. Jesus said, by their fruits you'll know them. Or, over time you'll be able to tell whether a person truly has come to know Christ or not. You say, well, how will you be able to tell? Here are the two biblical assurances of true conversion. Number one, abiding faith. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. So, if you really have it, you're going to keep on believing. Did you know that statistics say that 80% of people who walk in an aisle and in a crusade or an evangelistic service are not in any meaningful way following Christ two years later? Well, were they saved? Apparently not. He who endures to the end, 1 John 2.19 says, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they had have been of us, they would have remained with us. In other words, look up here. Genuine, saving faith continues. So you can't see it, but over time you'll see. How many people can think of people who used to love the Lord and used to follow the Lord and used to worship the Lord, now they don't care anything about Him anymore? Do you know people like that? Here's the sad part, though. Some of those people stop going to church. Some of them just keep on coming and sit in a service like this and go, what time is it? Ho-hum, ho-hum, ho-hum. And maybe family pressure or friendship pressure or pastor pressure is, is forcing you to keep coming. But listen, you honor him with your lips, but your heart is far from him. I believe the churches of Christ in America are filled with people who don't know Christ. They don't know him. They said a little prayer, they got caught up in religion, but they don't really know him whom to know is life eternal. You say, well, how can I know if I really know him? I'm telling you, abiding faith, faith that continues. Are you still going on? You say, well, yeah, but can't we backslide? 
Now, sometimes we backslide, but when we do, God reaches down and grabs us and pulls us back. That's Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you feel like you could walk away from the Lord and never come back? That's a very, very bad sign because those who really know him have this sense, oh, I could get a little way, but he jerked me back in line so fast and pour out a world of trials on me to tape hold of me and keep me where I need to be. Now, which person are you? Which person are you? Here's the assurances of salvation. Abiding faith, and then secondly, the fruit that that produces. Abiding in Christ, he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, Jesus said. And, and there's fruit. If, if, how do you know if you've got a real apple tree? <laughs> well, just wait till the fall. Are there any apples on it? Because if it's got apples, duh, it's an apple tree. How hard was that? Is she really a Christian? Is she really a Christian? Just give it some time. Because she'll bear fruit if she is. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. What are the fruits of a Christian? Well, Hebrews 13 talks about the fruits of, of worship. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruits of the Spirit, which is character traits. I'm more loving, more joyful, more filled with peace. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, growing in self-control. Man, I used to be out of control, but more and more I have self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. You can't see whether the Spirit comes into a person's life, but over time... There's going to be fruit. Now, if your faith isn't continuing, if you're not bearing fruit, you're not in Christ. And you're going to drift away. And the message of Hebrews chapter 2 is this. Don't drift away. We're all waiting to see. And notice it says in the text, therefore we, who's that include? Point to who that includes. That, that's all of us, me, you, all of us. We must pay closer attention lest we drift away. In other words, here's a thousand conversions, reported professions of faith. And over time, well, the parable of the sower we're going to look in in a moment would suggest that only 25% of professions are actually true conversions. Think of it. Only 25% truly repent of their sin and embrace Christ by faith. Only 25%. The rest are just doing religion, just doing religion. Not growing in love for Christ. Not growing in their hunger for God's word. Not growing in their understanding and passion for God's kingdom. Just doing religion. And I would bring a strong caution to some of you who have grown up in church families, who have heard the gospel message for your whole life. I'm asking you, you don't have it because your parents have it. Do you have it? Do you have it yourself? The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. You can get so secure in your little going to church with mom and dad thing that you think you're going to go to heaven. You could be in an accident tonight and drop right down into hell because you don't know Jesus Christ personally. Don't drift away from your salvation. If you do, you reveal you never really had it. You never had it. You say, well, I, I, I don't want to drift away. What can I do? Perfect question. Look at verse 1. Therefore, we must pay close attention. Pay close attention. There's the first thing. Wake up. Wake up. That phrase, pay close attention, in the New King James says, give more earnest heed. NIV says, pay more careful attention. It's a warning term. In secular Greek, it was a word used about fastening your anchor to the bottom of the ocean. Make sure you're secure. It's actually the idea of being on guard. It's like, wake up. It's like, do you have it? Do you have it? Well, well w wake up. This should matter to you. And if you're sitting here right now, guess what time is it? And who really cares? I'm telling you in Jesus' name, that is a very, very bad sign. And it's always a mystery to me that the people who most have it are most ready to say, do I really have it? Do I really have it? Because they see the value of it. And those who least have it are ho-hum, ho-hum. Are you done yet? It's a very, very bad sign. We're talking about your eternal destiny. We're talking about whether you really have been prepared to meet a holy God through the shed blood of his son, Jesus. And religion is not going to make it. And going to church is not going to make it. It's a true condition of repentance in your heart and faith toward Jesus Christ as your only hope. 
So wake up. You say, well, what puts us to sleep spiritually? I made a list. Number one, what puts us to sleep spiritually? The pursuit of pleasure as an end in itself. Living for grins, living for money, living for sensual pleasure, living for the next dinner out and car and clothing and whatever. Living for pleasure. And so coming to church for you is just another pursuit of pleasure. And, and did I enjoy the service this morning? And did I like it? And was it convenient for me? And, and not a real serious earnestness about the truth, but just a pursuit of pleasure, living for pleasure. That's the first thing that reveals or produces spiritual slumber. What puts us to sleep? The pursuit of pleasure as an end in itself. Here's the second thing. There isn't one. I thought I had a list, but the more I thought about it, it's just that in all of its forms. Romans 13 says, for now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in reveling and drunkenness, here comes the pleasure. Not in immorality and wanton or, or, or pursuit of pleasure. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh. Now I'm telling you, the vast majority of people don't have that. And listen, you can fall asleep spiritually. Just fall asleep and drift away. Maybe you'll walk out of the church and never come back. Maybe you'll just keep coming and sit in the chair every single week sort of enduring it, getting back into that sort of, well, God must be happy that I'm here, I'll go through it, sort of thing. So, don't drift from your salvation. Wake up. Secondly, listen up. Notice he says, therefore we must pay more attention to what we have heard. What we have heard. And what have we heard? We've heard some things about the gospel. That's what the gospel is. First and foremost, it's something that we have heard. Have you heard some things? Have you heard some things about Christ and who he is and what he's done for you? Have you heard some things? If you have, don't drift away from, he's really saying, don't drift away from the gospel. Now here's the thing. If you really have the salvation, if you really have it, there's something in you that loves, listen, that, that loves that message. The good news about Jesus. And it, it's your joy. And it's your song. And, and, and it thrills you to think about it. And when you meet other people, you wonder to yourself, do, do, do they have it? And you care about it so much. I was walking in the Woodfield Mall this week. It was amazing. And, and I, I can't remember why I was doing this, but I was reading something and walking and reading and walking and I heard these two ladies walking behind me and I could tell when I looked that they both worked at Marshall Fields because they had that like cool oval green name tag on and uh but here's what they were saying so I'm walking along and I'm just reading 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 and the one lady says he said I have to be born again and the other lady says well that's ridiculous I've never heard anything like that before and she says no no he said that if I'm not born again I can't see the kingdom of God and the other lady says, well, well, I believe God's just going to accept us as a human being and I'll be a human being and I'll just be there and God will accept me. Be, and, and the other lady says, well, but he said I have to be born again, but I don't understand it. And she says, it doesn't make any sense to me. She said, when I'm walking along, <laughs> you know, and I'm walking slower and slower. Well, I just, I had to turn and say, ladies, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I, I just couldn't help overhearing your conversation. And you know, the very message you're talking about is the message that I've given my life to. And I said, let me just tell you, first of all, it's true. We all have to be born again. We're born into this world dead spiritually. Alive physically, but dead spiritually. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. And it was amazing. They were like, oh, okay, all right. And, and it, listen, no one had ever explained the gospel to them. And so we just talked a little bit more. And I, and I said to them, listen, it's not that God doesn't love you. God does love you. And, and I know you think, well, he wouldn't reject you. But listen, he's not just loving. He's holy. He's a holy, righteous God, and sin has to be paid for. That's why Jesus came into the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish. And I went on to share the good news, and they listened. We'll think about that. I said, I'll pray for you that God will open your eyes to the glorious truth that's found in Jesus. Talk about an A opportunity, huh? This is like walking down Woodfield Mall, you know? It was just, it was amazing. But here's the thing. Do you have that in your heart? 
Do you have that reveling and joying and delighting in the gospel, the good news? He says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Lest we drift away from it. Wake up, listen up. That's the third thing. Keep up. We must pay closer attention to what we have heard. Keep up, lest we drift away from it. Actually, that word there, drifting away, is used only here in the New Testament. And it's the idea of, of, of being released from your anchor or your mooring like a boat on the water. The second night of the walk in the word tour that I showed you on the video, we were uh, in Buffalo. And uh, we got out of there, out of that church. There was a couple thousand people there. It was just an awesome night of God working. And we talked to people afterwards and prayed with people for so long. Climbed onto this bus so weary. I was asleep so fast and the bus was heading toward Toronto. But we had made arrangements. About 2 a.m. we were in Niagara Falls. And so we dragged ourselves off this bus. I had to see the falls, you know, got to see the falls. And so we all kind of dragged ourselves. Well, I'll tell you, I've never seen the falls when the lights are off. And I'm telling you, this dark water rushing, what is it, 185,000 gallons a minute going over these falls. If you've never, I'm telling you, it's amazing. But I'll tell you, at night, to see that cold water rushing, it's creepy, man. And, and it brought back to my mind something that I had seen when I was a child, but I'm told it's still there. Apparently many years ago, moored way up the river on the Niagara River, there was a barge, and two young men were given the responsibility of taking care of this barge. It was tied to a dock, and they were put on the barge overnight to make sure that whatever was on the barge was not disturbed. Well, the young men fell asleep, and somehow the barge became untied, and maybe it was the motion of the water. Well, can you imagine their shock to, this true story, can you imagine their shock to wake up and they are on this barge in the center of the Niagara River racing toward the falls. Well, of course, they began to scream, and it was morning time now, and people saw them rushing down the water, and they're saying, help us, help us, help us. And they couldn't get to them. Amazingly, about, uh, about a quarter of a mile before the falls, the barge struck a major rock in the center of the river and <laughs> stopped right there before they went over the falls. The boat's still there, and there was time, and they got a rope over there, and they were able to get the young men to shore. And uh, I'm sure everybody's like, I'm not going to get the boat. You get it. No, no, we'll just leave it there. And, and uh, so it's still there. Amazing, listen, an amazing picture of what happens to people. Jesus says, many people will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We worked in children's church. And he'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And do you realize profession does not equal conversion? Time will tell. Do you have abiding faith? Do you have the fruit that that produces? Listen, don't think callously, well, I got the fire insurance, I prayed the prayer, I'm all set. This is a warning this morning. Listen up. Do you really have this? Or are you just thinking that it's yours and perilously heading toward the falls? Now listen, if you're in Christ, sometimes we backslide. Has anyone here ever backslidden spiritually? Has anyone? Have you ever just kind of backslidden spiritually? Listen, Jesus will be the rock in the middle of the river for those who are truly his. But he will draw you back to himself. And that condition won't last for very long. If you don't know him truly though, you're, you're going right over the falls. This is a message to wake up. This is like, wake up. I'm not asking you if you think the people around you have it. I'm asking you, do you have it? out of love, as a pastor, concerned for his congregation. I can't settle the, the, the material, worldly state of Christianity in North America, but I'm very concerned for our church, and our elders will account for us. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Turn over to Matthew 13 for a moment. Keep your finger there. You can see for yourself that every Profession is not a conversion. Matthew chapter 13 says this. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And the picture there is of a path where, where the ground is beaten down and the seed of God's word, listen, the seed of God's word, the gospel, is sown into the person's heart, but it just sits on the surface it doesn't penetrate their heart because their heart is hard. 
That's a hard-hearted person, not truly converted. Verse 20, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And you know that if you have around your house some rocky soil, uh, the grass doesn't grow very well there along the edge of the driveway where the soil is thin and, 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 and rocky. And he's describing a human heart like that where, where you made, listen, listen, look up here. You made some impulsive decision to follow Christ. You were in a service somewhere or someone, you said, oh, I think I want that. Immediately you received the word with joy. Now this is good news. This sounds great. Who wouldn't want to go to heaven? I'm in. I'm in. But then persecution, notice he says in the text, or tribulation, all of a sudden it gets hard, and it's not easy to follow Christ. And all of a sudden, you fall away, you drift away, not truly converted. Verse 22, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. Listen up. Number one disease in North American Christianity. This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves what? Unfruitful, unfruitful. By their fruits you will know them. He who abides in me bears much fruit. So unfruitful, unsaved, unconverted. All children of God bear fruit. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. Jesus can only be first in your heart. He can't be second or third. And it's not that we don't struggle with that, but the growing passion of your life is that Jesus is first in everything. Notice now the true conversion. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, 100, in another 60, in another 30. And different people bear different amounts of fruit. All true conversions bear fruit. Now look up here. Are you truly converted? Does this even matter to you? Paul said, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Now if, Paul, if the apostle Paul had to check, Paul said, I fear that having preached to others, I would be disqualified. And just because you've shared God's word, even if you've preached God's word, doesn't mean that you even have it. Hell may be filled with people who told others about it, but didn't have it themselves. Do you have this? Do you really have it? Is there a growing pattern of holiness in your life and an enduring faith that is accelerating toward the finish line? He who began a good work in you, if he did, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If that's not happening, you don't have it. And as hard as it is to come to church... And have to consider, maybe I don't even really know the Lord. What will it be to look into the faces of people in eternity who were lulled to sleep by shallow preaching from portions of God's word that people prefer? That's why we're going into Hebrews. We want to hear all of God's word, amen? Now do you have it? Pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Lest we drift away from it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Here's the second main thought. Don't drift away from your salvation. Now a reason, because you won't escape if you do. There's no recovery from this. If Listen, if you hear the good news and you understand it and you recognize it as worthy and you step toward it and step toward it and step toward it, the message of Hebrews is, is if you stop short of true faith in Christ and then drift away, there's no recovery from that. And that's why he goes on and says this. Notice, this is his rationale. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, don't drift away from your salvation because you won't escape. He's going to use here a first century style of argumentation, a Hellenistic style of argumentation, um, which is the lesser to the greater. Think, everybody thinking? Everybody with me? Thinking now. He says, the argument from the lesser to the greater is, is, well, if this is true of something lesser, then it's that much more true of something greater. Do you understand? Notice, notice the argument. Since the message declared by angels, oh, I have to say something about that. Isn't it great that when you study God's word, you can just like learn stuff and you didn't know it? I've been studying God's word 
pretty steadily for 20 years. And I just learned in preparing this message that the angels were the ones that gave the message of God to Moses on Mount Sinai. How cool is that? I did not know that. I don't know how I missed that exactly, but Moses went up on the mountain. God came down and met with Moses there, but the angels, they were involved. And that's what he means when he says, the message declared by angels. If you're interested in that, Acts 7, 38, Galatians 3, 19, and Deuteronomy 33, 2, all teach us that angelic messengers brought the law of God to Moses. That's what he means. So this is the law we're talking about, the Ten Commandments and all the rest of it. Verse 2. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Proved reliable. Proved reliable. That's another nautical term. It means secured by an anchor. NIV says binding. New King James says proved steadfast. Here's the point. The things that God said would happen, (laughs) they were reliable. They happened. The law says if you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you get this. And everything that God said would happen would happen. People who did what was right were blessed, just like God said they would be. People who did what was wrong were judged, just like God said they would be. Now, if the message declared by angels proved reliable, and every transgression, do you see that? The word transgression means literally crossing the line. God said don't, and we said, I'm going to do it anyway. Every transgression or disobedience, the word disobedience is used of people who have bad hearing. And the idea of disobedience is, is you know what God wants you to do, you just flat out don't do it. Yeah, I heard that, but I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And here he says, every stepping across the line, every refusal to listen, received what? What's it say in the text? End of verse 2. What does disobedience and transgression receive? Okay. New American Standard says penalty. NIV says punishment. My translation says just retribution. And let me tell you something. This is a reference to life in the Old Testament. Nobody here ever lived in the Old Testament. Thank God we never lived in the Old Testament. Do you know what it was like in the Old Testament? You do something wrong, you pay the price. Fast. For example, if you break the Sabbath, you're stoned. You dishonor your parents, take them outside the city, stone them. This is what it was like in the Old Testament. You break the law, you suffer the consequences. Every day, all the time. You bring a sacrifice to the temple, you might get forgiveness. Or you might just get the consequences right now. This is what it was like to live under the law. Listen, sin was very serious. It was always punished immediately. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that was the lesser. Since the message declared by angels proved reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. In the Old Testament, look, look. They didn't have the scriptures in their hands. They didn't have the Savior. They didn't have the Spirit in their hearts. And even though they didn't have the scripture or the Savior or the Spirit, they were still judged on the spot for breaking God's law. Now if God held them with such little light to such a high standard, what kind of standard will we be held to We'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 where he says it so amazingly. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And then he hits the same argument again. Anyone who sets aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by one who has spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace? Man, if you were judged under the law, how much will you be judged under grace for rejecting what was freely offered in Christ? For hearing the good news of Jesus and, and counting the, well, that's okay. I, I, I suppose I could think about that. I'm not sure what I really think about that. Maybe I'll talk to God about it when I get there. No, no, he'll be doing most of the talking. Hebrew says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You would not want to go unprepared. Hebrews 9 says it's appointed unto man once to die. After this comes judgment. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm not asking you if you 
prayed a prayer or went to a church. I'm asking, do you have it? Look in the mirror. Does your life give evidence of a person truly redeemed by the Son of God? Is there an enduring faith? Is there a growing pattern of righteousness? Is there an increasing hunger for God's word? Is there a greater love of the gospel than there's ever been before? Increasing from glory to glory as you go on and God completes the work that he began in you. If you have to answer some of those questions, no. You better take a good, hard look at the true condition of your own heart. Why? Because you will not escape. Where are you going to go? How are you going to hide from the piercing eyes of him to whom we must all give an account? And listen, and that moment is racing upon us. It'll be here in just a moment. What a premium opportunity this is today to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, to examine yourself, to see if you're in the faith, How shall we escape if we neglect? And IV says ignore or disregard the idea is apathy or even indifference. Here's some symptoms of neglect or drifting away. Three of them. Here at Harvest we teach that a disciple of Jesus Christ worships Christ. So where are you at in worship? It grieves me to look out week after week and see people around the periphery standing through worship. Jesus the King is being rightly adored and we, it's not a good sign. I'm just telling you, it's not a good sign. Hebrews 13 says that one of the fruits of the Spirit is the fruit of lips that give praise to his name and want to do that and love to do that and long to, be honest, do you sometimes look at others fervently engaged in worship and say to yourself, oh, I'll never be like that. I'm not that into it. Maybe you're not into it at all. So worship. And walking with Christ. Spending time in God's word. Spending in fellowship with others. Growing in faith. Worshiping Christ, walking with Christ, working for Christ. We have some of the most faithful, phenomenal servants of Christ in this church. But it still just absolutely mystifies me the number of people who come in and out of church every week. You do nothing for God. You do nothing for God. You haven't picked up a finger to labor in the kingdom since you can remember maybe ever. The people who have it are working for God. They're looking for rocks to pick up and things to move and stuff to do. They love him and they want to work for him. If you don't have that, what do you have? You will not escape We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. How shall we escape if we neglect, notice the phrase, such a great salvation. That's the second argument. Don't drift away from your salvation because you won't escape and also because it's so great. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? How great is it? It's so great. It's freely offered. It's undeserved. All you must do is accept the gift in Christ that God offers. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He's giving it to you. How will you escape if you neglect something that awesome? As in, hey, you won the lottery. (laughs) Nah, I don't think I really want that. Hey, hey, I want to shower eternal blessing upon your family. Oh, no, no, we already have a lot of that. (laughs) Right, who would do that? As in, no one would. And when you really understand the prize that is in the gospel, the prize of Christ freely offered, (laughs) you'll embrace it with your whole heart. It's so great. And notice his rationale. He says, It was declared at first by the Lord. The first thing that makes the salvation great is who offers it. And who offers it? It's Jesus. He's the one. We're not here for our peers. We're not here for our parents. We're not here for the pastor. It's Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the one we love. He's the one we long for. He's the one we're following. It was declared by him. It's his gospel. It's his good news. Jesus Christ the Lord. We love him, don't we? And, and, and that's why it's so great, because it was declared by the Lord himself. Hey, 
I feel so bad for those people in Florida going through all those hurricanes, huh? That's why I feel so bad when I laugh at the guy on the Weather Channel. Have you seen those guys on the Weather Channel that right in the storm, you know, and they're like, it's really getting bad over here, you know, and they're screaming like this, and the wind's blowing and everything. I had to laugh. A man told me this week about seeing one of the guys, and he said, he said, uh, the winds are now 130 miles an hour. This is the worst Mother Nature can offer. What? That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. Do you know that the Chandra telescope, 700 times more powerful than the Hubble's telescope, now astronomers are looking into black holes in outer space where they estimate that the winds are upwards of a million miles an hour. And by the way, there's no such thing as Mother Nature. There's just God who made all of this. Jesus Christ the Lord. Listen, listen. He's the one that declares this salvation. This creator of the universe. This awesome, awesome God. That's why it's great. It's declared by Jesus Christ. He declared it. Notice, secondly, people experienced it. Look in the text. It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard. That's why the gospel is so great. It's because we see it making a difference in people's lives. It takes regular, ordinary people and makes them loving and caring and awesome in Christ. Don't you see the gospel changing people? Sometimes I wish you could sit in a seat that I am and see, listen, addictions broken and marriages healed and lives changed and bodies healed physically and miracles happened by the power of Christ. People are witnessing it. It's happening. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why the salvation is so great because it's real, because it changes people's lives. God does things for people they could never have done for themselves. Jesus declared it, people experienced it, and as I said, God himself confirms it. God also bore witness by signs and wonders. The first century saw the work of Christ. We see the work of Christ too. Various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It's not just the big sensational miracles that we see from time to time, though we do see those, and our church has seen many miracles. It's just the day-to-day awesome work of God through the gifts of his people going from selfishness to unselfishness, going from my agenda to Christ's agenda and laying down their lives for the gospel. You know, my wife and I were talking. We, listen, we are laying down our lives for the gospel. Are you laying down your life for the gospel? See, that's what God's producing in the people that really have it. And it's so awesome. It's so great. Now, I'm just going to ask you one more time. Do you have it? Not did you pray a prayer, not did you go to a church. Does your life, your enduring faith and that fruit, does it give evidence of a person who really has it? You will not escape if you neglect this great salvation. Don't drift away from it. You say, in fact, just pray with me right now and let me talk to you personally. You say, Pastor James, I I think I might be drifting away a little bit. I I think, come back, come back. You say, well, my heart, I think it's been getting a little hard. I've been caught up in other things. I've lost sight of, uh, of my primary purpose. Come back to him. Deuteronomy 4, 30 says, return to the Lord. Your God and listen to his voice. Deuteronomy 32 says, Return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all of your heart and soul. Isaiah 55, 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him for he will abundantly pardon. Lamentations 3, Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Hosea 6, come let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has wounded, but he will bandage us up. In Joel chapter 2, now return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. This is our God. Before we sing a single note of a song, I want to invite you just to come and kneel here at the front of the church. You've heard this message and you sense a stirring in your heart. I I might be drifting. I don't want to drift. Don't wait another moment. Just come and kneel here right at the front of the church and lay these things before him. And just say, I want to seek the Lord. I want to give my whole heart to the Lord. 
I want to be found in him. Just come and pray. See, I'm hearing this warning. I, I want to make full proof of my conversion. Lord, help us as we respond to you, each of us in our own way. Come, let us seek the Lord. Seek the Lord with all of your heart and he will be found by you. Come, let us return to the Lord. He will have compassion upon us. is to ignite passion in the people of God through the proclamation of truth. And you'll find more biblical teaching on this topic as well as many other resources on our website, walkintheword.com. You can request a complete catalog or order online. Or if you'd like to call us, our toll-free phone number is 888-581-WORD. Again, that's 888-581-9673. And you can call 24 hours a day. If you'd like to write to us, our website has both the U.S. and Canadian address information. And the website again, walkintheword.com. Well, thanks for listening to God's truth taught here on Walk in the Word. Our prayer for you is that you will continue to grow in Christ as you walk in the Word.